Hello folks, and welcome back to the geodynamics video lectures on the topic of thermal processes in the lithosphere. In this, the third of the video lectures on this topic, we're going to talk about advection. And so first we're going to introduce heat transfer by advection and how that operates within the lithosphere. And then look at an example of the solution of the advection diffusion equation in one dimension. So we've already looked at heat conduction and heat production in the previous video lecture set. And here we're looking at advection where we're talking about the transfer of heat by physical movement of molecules or atoms within a material. And so in this case, this, I want to make um, a distinction that we're not talking about movement of vibrating atoms within a crystal lattice in this case, like we did for conduction, but rather physical transport or physical displacement of some mass of material from one place to another. So you could think about something like a fault slipping in the earth where you have movement of rock on either side of the fault and as a result you transfer heat that way. Now mathematically we can look at uh, advection in a similar way to how we've done things for uh, heat conduction. And that is that here we have on the left side the change in temperature with time. And if we only consider advection, that's simply equal to Vy times the temperature gradient with depth. And so in this case, Vy is something new, and that is the velocity of material in the vertical direction, which is the Y part of Vy in this case. So that's the basic representation of advection. In, uh, in an equation. Now, of course, in the previous um, video lectures, we looked at the time-dependent heat conduction equation, and so we can plug in this term to that equation, where we have now dt dt, the change in temperature with time, being equal to a diffusion term, which is kappa times the second derivative of temperature with depth, plus this advection term, which is vy times dt dy, like we see above. And so when we put these two things together, we have now the one-dimensional advection diffusion equation, which is a very useful equation for considering heat transfer processes in the lithosphere. Now, that equation is essentially shown um, in kind of cartoon form over here on the left, where there's a plot of a geotherm, so you can see temperature increasing here, depth increasing uh, vertically downward, plus z is depth in this case rather than y. This is a figure out of a different textbook. And here we have some initial temperature. It's just linearly increasing with depth. And if we were to advect this rock vertically upward toward the surface, we might have the dashed line here that would be the temperature or the geotherm uh, as a result of only advection. And so you can see, of course, in this case, that surface temperatures would have increased significantly, but we would still have this linear trend otherwise. Now we know that when we take some rock from interior, you know, the interior of the Earth, some massive rock, and move it up toward the surface, of course, the surface is relatively cold, and so that massive rock will begin to cool down as a result of heat conduction or diffusion. And so that's what this solid line here, labeled T1, would be representing the effects of both diffusion, which is going to have our rock mass cooling down, and advection, which would have heated the um, rock up as it was moved toward the surface, or uh, displaced. Now when we talk about uh, advection, one of the most common things for geodynamics um, would be to consider the processes of erosion and sedimentation as examples of um, advection within the lithosphere. So over here on the left, we have a cartoon version of erosion, and uh, what this would mean in this case would be a case of um, the surface of the Earth not changing elevation with time, but rock being moved upward perhaps by a fault that's active beneath um, some massive rock, and then being eroded at the surface such that the uplift as a result of the tectonic motion is balanced by erosion. Now in a scenario like that, what you can see essentially is that we're moving mass up toward the surface where it's then eroded. In other words, we're taking relatively warm rocks and moving them up toward the surface 
and this results in an increase in the temperatures with depth or increase in the geothermal gradient as a result of the process of erosion. Sedimentation, on the other hand, has just the opposite effect. You can think about a sedimentary basin where perhaps the elevation of the basin isn't changing with time, but essentially every time there's some space made for sed sediment to be deposited, sediment will fill in the accommodation space. In a scenario like that, essentially what you're doing every time you add sediment to the basin is you're putting relatively cool material uh, that's at surface temperatures into the basin and piling that material downward with time. So this results in a downward mass transport of cool material that tends to decrease thermal gradients with depth. And so both of these processes can be active in uh, places like mountain ranges um, and both can be quite significant in modifying the crustal temperatures in those regions. Now if we want to look um, at an example here of the solution of the advection diffusion equation, we can do that in one dimension. And we're going to find an analytical solution, which means it's something we can simply uh, solve with a little bit of math. We don't need to do anything fancy. So here's our advection diffusion equation in one dimension that we saw on one of the earlier slides. And we'll make a first simplification, and that is to assume that the temperature dependence, the time dependence, is, um, can be ignored. In other words, we're in steady state, so dt dt equals zero. And if we set this left side equal to zero, we can then simply rearrange things a little bit to end up with the equation below. So here, um, we've done a couple things. First off, we've divided both sides by kappa. So over here, we had a vy before. Now we have a vy over kappa. This is negative because it's been moved over to the other side from this term um, that was initially there. And we've pulled out this um, second derivative so that we have the derivative of the first derivative um, in the way that it's written in the equation. The reason for doing this is it allows us to make a simple substitution where we can say, um, we'll call this uh, lambda being equal to vy over kappa, that's just this thing here, and we're going to say f is equal to dt dy. So if we do that and you look at this equation here, we can simply rewrite the equation as f prime of y, or the first derivative of f, which is simply what this would be here, right? We're taking the derivative of this thing here, which is now called f, is equal to negative lambda times f of y. And so that's minus this thing is lambda here, and there's our f again. And so this is a common differential equation. f prime of y is equal to minus lambda times f of y. And the solution of such a differential equation takes the form of f of y is equal to f of zero times e to the minus lambda times y. That's the reason for doing that substitution is it makes it very easy to see this differential equation. So if we take our general solution and its form that we have seen already, we can now plug in our substituted variables and basically rearrange our equation back to uh, terms that we had previously. So now in place of f we've put in dt dy is equal to minus dt dy at y equals zero, that's our f of zero term here, times e to the minus vy y over kappa. So all we've done here is just plug in the values for lambda. Now as we've done with the heat conduction equation previously, we know we have to apply boundary conditions in order to find a solution and the boundary conditions that are easiest to use in this case are to assume temperatures equal to zero at depth equals zero and the temperature equal to TL at depth YL. And so you could think about this as being the temperature at the base of the lithosphere and this Y being the depth to the base of the lithosphere. If you apply those boundary conditions, you find something that looks like this, where temperature T is equal to TL, the temperature at the base of the lithosphere, times one minus E to the minus VYY over kappa, divided by one minus e to the minus vy l over kappa. So you can see the only difference in these two terms is that you have y in the top and l in the bottom. And that'll allow us to, uh, for instance, calculate the change in temperature with depth 
including the effects of both advection and um, heat conduction or diffusion. Now, just to make a point about the boundary conditions and why they're important, we have um, alternative boundary conditions that could have been used. Uh, here, we've assumed a temperature um, that's known at the top of T equals zero at Y equals zero, and here is T equals 1000 degrees at Y equals 100 kilometers depth. So this would actually be similar to what we've just calculated. An alternative boundary condition would be to say, okay, we know the surface temperature is equal to zero, and we'll say that the temperature at infinite depth is 1,000 degrees. And all I want to show you here is that these are predicted geotherms for different advection velocities. And you can see here, for instance, that at um, an advection velocity of 0 0.1 millimeters per year, with an infinite temperature at 1,000 degrees, you know, the temperature at a thousand or sorry a hundred kilometers depth is not even 300 degrees whereas here at a hundred kilometers depth we know that all of the geotherms have to come to a thousand degrees so the boundary conditions make a big difference and they're important so it's important to think about the boundary conditions anytime you deal with um, these types of equations all right so that's it for this video lecture on advection and when we come back we'll take a look at some examples of heat transfer by advection in the following video lecture.